So this presentation is connecting with people through social gaming. Um, and I'm going to talk mostly a, a high-level strategy of what other games uh, or what other companies are doing with games to make them social uh, and connecting with their users. And I'm going to go just an overview and also talk about monetization a little bit. And then towards the end, we'll get more technical and talk about the code and how we could implement uh, in either our games or some of the other apps that we're using right now. So here we have a list of, this is the App Store, and this, I just want you to pay attention to this column here, this like, top closing column, load free, and there are some things in common here. So the audience participation part, what do they all have in common? And now this is, I don't know if I said game, this is the app store for all apps, from Excel oh, to Angry Birds. Oh, they're all free. The, the left side. Yeah. Yeah. They're all free. Anything Mostly else? games. They're all games. There you go. They're all games. And, Except uh, the calculator. <laughs> well, no. Well, on the left side, we're looking at uh -oh. uh, top grossing. Not the free side. We don't care about free. Because the company's got to make money, as Rich said. Uh, so... The top grossing games are all free, which seems counterintuitive to someone who's not familiar with the industry, but uh, these free games have to make money somehow. And the, I think the top paid game right now is Assassin's Creed, and that's at number 11, so it's not even on this list. The one after that is 18, I think that's Minecraft, and then after that, the next top paid game is all the way down at 44. So in the top 50 or so, there's only three games that you actually pay for, yet everything else is making more money. So, how do they do this? Any ideas? If they're not making money when you buy them, yet they're dominating the top grossing chart, how does this happen? In that purchases, who knows the buzzword for a game that's free? That freemium! There we go. User participation is killing it. So, anyone know uh, a non-game freemium app, as an example? Well, it's a game. How about Meet Me? Would Meet Me be considered freemium? It's a free app. We make money somehow. We're, we're here at, uh, in upstate New York. So, uh, so freemium is the dominating, take a look back, it's the dominating uh, pattern for making money, not just in games, but in general. And uh, that's because people, they like to try something, like to try before they buy. So, uh, so the main concept with freemium is you get a user comfortable with your product, they like your product, and then they later on, when they're, when they're uh, sold already, when they're warm customers, then they'll start buying. So advertisements, in-app purchases, all part of freemium. <clears throat> so if you play a game like... Uh, a paid game like Call of Duty or Assassin's Creed or any of these kind of games, uh, the more traditional games, usually pay a very large upfront fee, $60 for an Xbox game or PlayStation or computer game, and, um, and you expect that it has a certain amount of unique content levels, very well designed, and it has usually a storyline where there's a progression and then there's an end. Um, and so with this expectation, that's when users and players are okay with paying $60 for a game because they expect they're going to get that. With social games, you don't have an ending usually, like a paid game does. You just sort of keep doing the same thing over and over again. And instead of a strong storyline with a definitive ending, social games instead have a core loop. And this is a, a very complex and confusing core loop, which we won't go over. It's for a game called Heyday, which is sort of like a Farmville clone. Um, but the, the common elements of a core loop is you're not moving forward in a storyline towards a goal. Uh, there is no end game. It's playing the game is, is the end game. Um, it's a loop. It's, it's very profitable because it keeps people coming back without having to generate a bunch of content up front. Uh, so in... Uh, some common loops are you have to wait for crops to grow and then you have to, or maybe you're waiting for a dragon to hatch or you're waiting for your troops to train and you're collecting resources, this kind of thing. And um, after a certain amount of waiting, some sort of big event happens. You sell everything or, or you go to battle with a neighboring clan. 
And after that, you get your rewards after this big event, and then the loop starts over. So Clash of Clans we're going to talk about. Is anyone familiar with Clash of Clans? This is my how y'all doing kind of moment. Mm -hmm. Is anyone familiar? Anyone play it or see it or hear anything about it? I've but seen it all over. They yeah, advertise, like, everywhere. right on, on that other uh, on that other top app, apps chart. I think it's number two behind Candy Crush right now. It was number one for a really long time. Uh, the company Supercell, who makes Clash of Clans, they also made Heyday, which is this is the loop for Heyday. So Supercell has two games. They have Clash of Clans and Heyday. And as of the last article I read on it that talked about how much money they were making, um, I think that was maybe six, nine months ago, something like that, they're making $2.4 million a day in in-app purchases just from these two games. It's the only two games they have, um, which sounds like a lot. And then when you multiply it out over the course of a year and figuring they've been at the top of the charts all this time, I don't even know how much they're making now. $2.4 million a day. Right, And this is a... This is a, a team that five people made this, this game. So in the course of a year, at, um, imagine at this point, it's probably closer to a billion dollars. I mean, 2.4 million times the days in a year is something like 700 million, but that's also old data. So I'm, I'm going to say it's probably close to eight, 900 million a year. They, as a point of reference, in October, they sold 51% share to SoftBank from Japan for 1.5 billion. Right. The, their valuation is incredible. And, you know, I like to point out five people made this. So a, a company that's worth over a billion dollars. So I think that's pretty inspiring. Stories like this inspired me to get into making games uh, when I was first learning developing. And, you know, it's just something to keep in mind what just a couple people can do. But anyway, that, that's not the main point of my presentation here. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about Clash of Clans to give you some context. Uh, so you have like a home base. This is your this is your home base. This is your clan, and you have these resources, like elixirs that you're mining for, and things that generate coins, coin mines. And so you get these little builders, and they go and they collect things, and and eventually you have to farm these resources, whether it's uh, elixirs or whether it's uh, farm products and heyday. It's the same kind of concept. And uh, this, this happens over the course of a day. And then you do little, you build little upgrades, like training centers, and it takes some time, see it's 43 minutes for whatever this is to finish building. And, uh, and then you also train troops, so that, that takes time as well. So to talk about the core loop for Clash of Clans, you spend your time gathering these resources, and then you wait, and then this inner loop is the main loop. And then once you get some resources, then you have enough money to build or train, and then you do more and more until eventually you have enough to do a battle with a neighboring clan or neighboring goblins or whatever. Um, so the thing to note here is that your resources and your buildings, is, they don't appear instantly. This little clock is here for everything because you have to wait. And so this, what this mechanic does is a few things. One, it encourages multiple sessions per day. So I could send my little builders to go out and scavenge elixirs, and then I can come back an hour later, and then I have to collect what they did. It just doesn't happen automatically. So this incentivizes you to come back to the app. It trains you to just keep coming back, because you can collect your resources in 30 seconds, and then just go on with your day, and you can do it again in an hour, in two hours. So people who are really into this find themselves on the app 10, 15, 20 times a day, easily. Um, Likewise, it takes time for your troops to train back in uh, these training locations or, or buildings to build. All of this takes time. And so, as I said, the main, uh, the main common factor here is that you are waiting for all these things to happen. And then once you do the battle, that's when you get your big bonus, your coins, and then you get rankings, and you get recognition, which we'll talk about later, how that comes into social gaming. Um, so, and then in a battle, that's when you fight your friends, or you fight neighboring clans or goblins, and then you start over again. So, from what I've told you in this core loop, you know, there's all these things, goblins, uh, berserkers, who would you say that the user's main enemy is in this game? User, audience participation, who's the main enemy? Time. 
You have to wait. That's exactly right. You have to wait for resources. You have to wait for buildings to build. And the problem is the player doesn't want to wait. They want to fight their battle now. They want to get their recognition. They want to get their big chest of gold so they can make their statue of themselves or whatever. And so the user doesn't necessarily want to wait, but it's built where they have to wait. So what do they do if they want to do something now? Well, they have these things called gems. And what gems do, and it, it, in different games it's called different things, but there's this sort of similar concept. If you don't want to wait 43 minutes for this to build, you want it done now, you can spend a gem. And then, boom, it's done instantly. Right? Sounds great. And early on in the game, they give you lots of gems, and they sort of tutorial you how to use them, and they get you into that mode, and everything's cheap. It costs one gem, and look, 40 minutes I saved. That's great. Uh, but as the game progresses, things become more expensive. Maybe it costs five gems, or maybe you ran out of gems, and gems are very rare. And so when the gems dry up, there's two ways to get more. Money, right? And this is why Clash of Clans is at the top of the chart, because people are spending 20 50 and this goes back further here, $100 on gems. Because what they're really buying is time. And, you know, it makes sense. There's a lot of things that... I do during the day that I'd rather pay someone five bucks, twenty bucks to to gain hours of my life back. Um, so it makes it makes a lot of sense why people would pay. They're really into the game. The other alternative to to usually to get gems or something that uh, equivalent is social to either invite players. They give you they give you um, incentives to invite your friends or or you can donate to your clan, or you can get donations from your clan. And so that does a few things. Um, for one, it just makes the game better, uh, but also it helps it go viral. You want to invite your friends. You want to make friends even with people you don't know. And uh, so that, that's another reason why Clash of Clans is on top, because they've incorporated social elements into their game. So to sum it up, if the user wants to continue their game, or if they want the best stuff, they have the options to wait buy or request, request a friend. Uh, so waiting is obvious, and uh, we just covered how Clash of Clans uses in-app purchases, uh, but let's take a deeper look on a, a game that's really using requesting and getting the social element core into their game and uh, involving their friends. And it's Candy Crush, which is currently number one at the top. Anyone play this game? I'm sure everyone's at least heard of it. You got Facebook friends that are trying to get you to give them lives, right? Don't even know what that means. And um, so what they do is they condition they condition you very early to be social, and they don't they ask you to help out your friends, and it's very easy to do so. And I think it doesn't even cost you anything to help your friends out, but they get you they get you getting your friends involved, and it doesn't cost your friends anything. But now their app is on your friend's device as well as your device. So this is a very viral game, and um, where Clash of, Cl Clash of Clans really focus on the in-app purchases, uh, Candy Crush has smaller dollar amount in-app purchases, but much more focused on the social aspect. Uh, and what Candy Crush does is they max out at level 35. Apparently it's a very addicting game. I don't like it, uh, but a lot of people do. And then you need, to get to the next level, you can either buy the next level, or you can have your friend invite you. Unlock more levels by asking your friends on Facebook for help. Right? And who doesn't want to help out a friend? So you may get annoyed that people are doing this, but uh, it's working out very well for them. And they focus mainly on the quantity of interactions as opposed to quality interactions. Um, so some reasons that people want to make a game social as developers is uh, the obvious thing is you want to increase your number of users you want to improve your retention and get give a better user experience and uh, it it seems to me from studying the games that the games that do the best are the ones that sort of improve their that they use their social their social uh, elements not in a selfish way where it's like invite all your friends and then you don't give them anything. The best games are the ones that make social gameplay really add to the to the games itself. 
you know, where it's not just like you're inviting friends and now you have a friend on a friends list. You want your friends to be very involved with what you're doing in the game. It makes it more fun and it improves retention because you just keep coming back. And uh, just from a marketing perspective, it's easier and better, and cheaper to keep a current customer than to go out and get a new one. So you'd rather just retain the people that you have and sort of keep milking them for money for lack of a better term. So as I was saying, it's not enough to just invite your friends. The social mechanics need to make sense and they need to be involved in the gameplay itself. So it's important to ask what the users are seeking in social games because that's often not the same thing as what uh, but the developers are trying to gain from social games. So it's a give and take. Uh, we talked about retention, and the best way to keep a user coming back is they need to have a feeling that they're making progress, right? They're leveling up. Their their home base is getting bigger. They have stronger walls, and you know they dominate more of the land, or whatever the case is. They're farming all over the U.S. Um, so, and another important aspect is competition and showing off. So that's why we have things like leaderboards and compare to your friends and, and things like that. It's a lot more fun for a user to display their achievement like trophies that you can see rather than a trophy that's just in your closet that nobody ever gets to see. Um, and so the important thing there is to make it very public through leaderboards or in the area where people interact in game. You know, if you have a level 50 drow elf with you know, all this like super armor, you want it so everybody can see it. And when you design the game, it should be like that. Everybody should know what everybody has so that there's this level of competition underneath the hood. So now I'll uh, talk a little bit more about the nitty gritty of how to implement some of these features and talk about Game Center. Um, and obviously, uh, the easiest way to make a game social is just to connect through Facebook, invite friends. But uh, this is a little more in depth. So Game Center is Apple's social gaming network, and uh, it's implemented using GameKit in iOS. And it provides a place for users to have a profile and to keep friend lists, uh, keep track of their games, and a few other features. So these are the most well-known ones. We have uh, the achievements, leaderboard, multiplayer, and uh, the main thing you need to do with Game Center is uh, the first thing you need to do is to authenticate the player. So here's an example of when you authenticate a player. Uh, well, actually, this isn't when you first do it. Uh, a view controller pops up. It's very easy to do so. Um, but once you sign in once, then you're pretty much in until you sign out. So uh, usually, if anyone has Game Center, anytime you come into a game that supports Game Center, you'll have this welcome back, whatever your name is. So this is the, the uh, view controller that pops up when you authenticate. And uh, as I said, it's really easy. You don't need to create it from scratch. Game Kit handles most of the heavy lifting. And I'm not going to go over how to implement this, but I will show the authentication process here. So uh, this is pretty much it. Um, and uh, you can make certainly helper methods to make this a little easier. And this is just a sample method. This isn't an included method. But you would want to incorporate some sort of method very early on in the game starting process. You don't want it to authenticate midway through a game when you might have needed to access certain game, uh, game center features. Um, and most of these are sample methods in here. Um, so what this is doing is you're just setting the authentication handler block. And this is the view controller that we talked about. And this is a sample method. This is a sample method. But pretty much, this is just showing the view controller. This would be root view controller, show this view controller. And then you want to check to see if they're authenticated. And then if it is, then you just want to do some setters here. And you want to enable uh, game center. And then if not, you want to disable game center. Um, which, again, these are sample methods, but you implement it how you want. It, it's pretty much that simple. You just need to have some sort of way to know whether or not there's an authenticated player, some sort of flag. Off of uh, yeah, like local player, what kind of information do you have access to? Um, well, well, this is this is a singleton here, 
And then the local player, um, it has a, I know it has an ID, but you also have things like uh, achievements and, and scores and things like that. Um, I didn't really go into it too much on here, but it's, you know, it's pretty easy to check. And you do. Friends underage and authenticated. Underage. Always directly on. Yeah, they, they can underage. track that. <laughs> okay, yeah, then I guess for the, um, for achievements and things like that, that would be a, a different, a different object, which I'll show you in a second. Let's see. So for achievements, this is an example of a, a custom table, obviously. Um, you unlock achievements throughout the game and uh, you track your progress. And this also ties with showing off because you want to check your friends' achievements and see what they've got, what you've got, see how you compare. Um, so Game Center does provide classes that make it easy to present this information um, just a little more generic. And in here, they each come with, uh, with an icon that are question marked out if you don't currently have it. And there's some cool things you could do. Um, so all these, all these, uh, everything on here you need to set up with iTunes Connect first. You can't just do sample, uh, sample achievements or sample leaderboards in the code, unfortunately. Every single one needs to be set up through iTunes Connect because it goes through the Game Center server. Uh, but it's not very difficult to set up. I think I have a screen in here showing how it goes. Um, so there's other cool things you could do, like you can make an achievement hidden where you can't find out what it is or how to get it until you reach that achievement in the game by accident. Um, and there's also percentage complete where you could check, let's say this is one where you know it's 20 laps to become an amateur racer, and maybe you click on it and it'll tell you you're, 14 of 20 laps there. Let's see, and then you can also make achievements repeatable, so you can get them multiple times and you get these points. Again, going into uh, feeling like you're making progress. And uh, this this view controller, just keep it in mind because I don't think I have another slide showing it, but it's the same one that we're going to use to show leaderboards and achievements. So this is would be how how you would uh, get an achievement uh, submitted to Game Center. And so this assumes that you already have the achievements set up in iTunes Connect. And this also assumes that you've created uh, this as an identifier in iTunes Connect. And so it has to match. Um, the convention is reverse DNS and then adding your game name and then the achievement name. And so every GK achievement object that you complete has to have this percent complete. And so when you submit it to Game Center, Game Center will take whatever is higher, the current level complete, current percent complete, or whatever you put in here. So your achievement can never go backwards. Um, and then you could have you have, uh, other options, like whether you want to show the banner. I think there might be some more. Um, then you send in an array because it could be that you want to send multiple achievements at the same time. And then you just send it in. And you know, if you have an error, you could do some sort of error handling here, however you want to handle that. But yeah, I mean, it's just uh, these built-in report achievements sent in the array. Um, so it's, it's pretty simple. Once you get it set up on the back end to report achievements, you can do this at the end of every level or at the end of any significant event. So here's an example of a custom leaderboard. Um, and again, to show off competition, there's a lot of reasons to, uh, to have a, a more in-depth leaderboard. So you might notice that this has uh, top players, but also top plans, which is obviously a very custom kind of thing to do. So this is something that certain games do to, uh, to foster that social element, where you're not just playing for yourself, you're playing for the clan, which is cool because it keeps everybody accountable. And uh, if you click on the clan, you see it says 48 members, 48, 49. Um, you know, there's a limit to the amount of clan members, and they're constantly kicking people out who are lagging behind. So that keeps people, you know, wanting to, nobody wants to get kicked out of the clan. So just keep participating, keep donating, and keep playing, which ends up more purchases, and it's good for the company. Uh, so here's iTunes Connect. Um, this, this is how you would create a leaderboard, and I have most of it covered up here. But um, the one thing to keep in mind is that everything that you submit uh, for leaderboards has to be an integer, specifically a 64-bit integer. And so you have to do a little hacking to get it if you want it to be something other than an integer, say something with two decimals. 
Uh, but once you send your integer in, it, it'll format it however you, you want it and select for the leaderboard, whether it's um, you know, how, how quickly you finished laps or how many orcs you killed or whatever it is. So, and how you have to hack it is knowing that you're going to send in, let's say you want to send in something that's going to be 5.7 seconds. You're going to have to multiply that out, make it 57, send it in, and then tell it here to turn it into a decimal. And so you just have to always prepare for that. If you know you're going to need two decimal points, you're going to always want to send in an extra two zeros on your 64-bit uh, integer. And I'm not sure if I mentioned that, but it has to be a 64-bit integer. That's the only requirement. So here's an example of submitting to a leaderboard. And so here you have your score, which will probably be you know, not a hard-coded number, but some sort of variable. And this is your 64-bit integer. And your leaderboard ID, again, we're assuming that you uh, named it somewhere else. And so you need to set its value. And I'm not sure if you need to set the context, but it's a, it's a good idea. And what context is, is it's, it's basically like a tag. Um, so it can mean whatever you decide, because later on, you could get scores back when, when you're presenting, let's say, a custom leaderboard. And maybe you want to tag it with, uh, if someone has over a certain amount, you want to show a green border or whatever. And so um, you, know, you, could, you could set your context here based on whatever you want to do with it. Um, and so pretty similar to the way we, we submitted achievements, um, you have to make an array and just submit it. Completion handler and handle errors, and that's about it. This is all built in. Uh, so, I mean, as you saw, it's, it's relatively few lines of code to make a game social, and it's a little bit on the back end. You have to do it iTunes. But um, if, uh, if you do it right, if you build a game right, then you could really integrate social interactions into your game. And, uh, and I think it's something that we should think about, not just for games, but just with, with our Meet Me app. Uh, how can we increase retention by making users have more fun with each other? You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be Sprite Kit. Jed's shown that you can do really cool stuff with UI Kit in games. Um, so if we're bringing people together, how can we do that better as the app evolves or even using the standalones? What new features can we add that just makes it a little more fun or a little more social? As long as we're focusing on the users and making sure they're having a good time and they're getting their connections, then we'll get better retention and eventually just a better app, better experience. And uh, that's I think, what we're looking for long term. So that's it for my presentation. Any questions? Any clapping? Anyone wants to? Okay, great. Thank you. James. James. So, uh, John, that's some of that stuff crosses the line into like, you know, if you have the idea of what you would consider an immoral game company versus a moral game company, and what you might think you know, Zynga's methods are immoral because they, they pander to the most base addictive personalities of the gamer in order to just, you know, drive up retention or, or cash it. I feel like there is like a, a more, there's a middle ground in there that might be less. Uh, Parents. Yeah, well, just you figure sense. most of these games, probably the vast majority, nobody's spending any money. It is that yeah, poor one percent. Again, if the article I was looking at, um, Clash of Clans is at like ten percent of users buy anything, and, and that's, that's pretty good. That's really high for yeah. the industry. Yeah, and still that much revenue. Yeah, right. Because yeah, people that do buy it, buy a lot. The, yeah, they probably the spend hundreds of dollars. This year, they were they were making revenue. Almost 200 million a month for the last set of stuff. I mean, they, they were making 200 million. Is that just on Clash of Clans or the whole company? I think that was just Clash of Clans. So then, if that draw something even is making like crazy, like 20 million dollars a day. You know, 500 million dollars a day. 500 million dollars a day. I don't think. <laughs> so wait, but you said 200 million a month, right? So is that that's like 2.4 billion? Is that the math? Am I doing that right? So that's even way more than, than I thought I mean, like I originally. Said, they're, I they're, thought it would be about a billion. They're valued at three billion right now. Um, Again, five people started that game. There's more than five people in this room. <laughs>
last year they made a profit of more than 40 cents on every dollar of goods sold, or 40 million in profit on sales of 100 million. That was 2012, or maybe 2011. Yeah, because they, they have much more than that. No, it says last year, so it should have been 2012. Is that per month? The game just blew up recently. Uh, it, it, it just shot up a lot in the short term. Um, Sales were was two hundred million in twenty eleven, or I'm sorry, two hundred and three thousand, hundred and five million in twenty twelve, and the first quarter this year was one hundred and seventy eight million. So they've made more in the first quarter of twenty thirteen than they made in the entirety of twenty twelve by almost double. Yeah, and and again, this is just one. If we if we go back, oh, whatever, I don't care. But if we go, if we imagine that I went back to the. Um, to that screen, there are tons of social games. In there. Um, just go right here. So even if you're not making, no, it's, oh, it's already it's out of it. So even if you're not making a hundred million dollars a month, I mean those games are you know could easily be making you know a million dollars a month, like probably way more than that for the top ten. Um, uh, as far as I can tell, it's international. Um, the, the, two, two, the two top games are, are Candy Crush and, and Clash of Clans are frequently brought out as one of the few internationally successful social games. So what, what Clash of Clans did is the people who founded Supercell, they worked at some other company, I think Digital Chocolate or something, and there was a game almost exactly like Clash of Clans, uh, and it was called Galaxy something, Galaxy Wars, and it was very similar, where you had like a space hub, and you were an alien, and then the tutorial was just exactly the same. Oh, aliens are coming, quick, you know, build up your base here, train troops. The game was carbon copy, exactly the same, but they skinned it with a theme that is extremely popular right now, fantasy. Um, you know, from Game of Thrones to uh, Hobbit, just fantasy is very big right now. And it was the right time, it was the right... Uh, you know, it was just the right game, and they, they really pushed really pushed it. And I think what they did, I'm not sure if they did this, but I know a lot of other social companies do, is they beta test in Canada first. They release it just in Canada, tweak everything right, then they do U.S., and they go spread out from there. Oh, the ethics. I don't think well, I not that. that. <laughs> no, just was it marketing, or was it some in-app like social feature, or was it, what was it that kind of, or what could Featured at some point. They did get featured at some point. Um, they were actually they didn't have money apparently to, to advertise, so they did a lot of stuff with hoping that Apple would feature them. And based on my reading, it there there was some set of social things that they did that really drew it, and and it may be the clan stuff or, or something similar where their focus was on letting get convincing people to invite more people. Right. And once right uh, right once you have that social things. one. And that's really one of the hard things to do, is you have to convince people to, to game with other people because solo gamers are less likely to actually do anything. Spend right. money, continue playing. Once you have you know a, a core set of players that are all, they know each the other. The clan is relying on you. Yeah, <laughs> but once you have the clan is relying on you, you're more likely to yeah. go, well, oh, I don't have time, well, let me just spend a buck fifty. Yeah. yeah, you're emotionally invested at that point. <clears throat> you, your own clan, or your own little territory, but then your clan as a whole. And then, you know, if you're on a leaderboard and you were number one and then some other clan comes up and you're number two, well, what are you going to do? You know, everybody's got to put in double time. I mean, you see it in, um, in like, World of Warcraft kind of games. It's this, once you get people together, then, you know, there's that sense of everyone's relying on everybody. You can see that. It took them a year to really start taking off, and then it's only been this year that they were really high. So, I mean, it's not like they instantly shot up. They've been around for a while, and they haven't necessarily been the breakaway success that they are right now. Well, they, did, well, they didn't abandon it either, it sounds like. No, no, no. So, I mean, I mean, you can see, and you went from 200,000 to one to 100 million in the first, from year one to year two. I mean, you're not going to abandon it. Right. But I think the thing, too, is they found a model that works, and they implemented it before. It was probably as mainstream as it is now. You know, they found a game that people like, that whatever that Galaxy game is, and they just put it in a, a better marketed um, genre, 
and then they you know, really push it forward. And a lot of companies are doing the exact same thing. You just need a core loop. You need so something that's, that's that people that's do. That's Apple's business model. Yeah. How do they take the core of that game? Is there like open source frameworks? No, no. Well, they, they made, made the other game. Oh, they did. Yeah. So I guess they didn't sign an NDA or something? Or whatever. Well, not NDA. It's just like um, anything else. You, you, cannot, you can't patent or copyright or do anything with mechanics. It's, it's just there's no protection yeah. for mechanics. Although if you if you played this other game and then you played Clash of Clans, it's zero different. So I, I don't know if there would be any no, lawsuits. I was gonna say there's no there's no protection. You could look at the uh, radical fishing debacle or the the other one that that team put but, out. Yeah, there, there's plenty of uh, Minecraft clones right now in the App Store too, and they look exactly the same. Yeah. Else in here? I guess we're done. No, no, no. I'm not trying. To, no. <laughs> no, we are. I wanted to come in. Yeah, it's not really good. It's cool. No, it's it just over. finished, yeah. <gasps>